Tillich is probably the most influential Protestant theologian of his day. He has been one of the most creative and effective architects of the new Protestantism which developed in America after World War II. When we met, we spoke of belief and faith, of religious commitment and man's ultimate concern, and I asked him what he saw in the context of his own life and experience as its sum and substance. For Paul Tillich, modern man is unique at least in terms of the dilemma which bears upon him. And what is involved is at once so basic and pervasive that to resolve it calls for nothing less than the complete re-examination of everything that has come in our time to be accepted as important and meaningful for human values. More specifically, for Paul Tillich, this has meant reconsidering and restating Christian doctrine. And as he did this, he brought on the problem, in addition to his impressively creative theological background, the suggestions of modern art, psychology, and existentialism. He has provided a new lexicon, such concepts as ultimate concern, new being, a new reality, and all of them emerging from the basic premise that the traditional concept of God is dead. As we talked of these things one afternoon, we spoke of what each of us, in some way, perhaps intuitively, had come to see as unquestioned areas of our own human commitment. And I asked him what, at this time, he could see as his own areas of faith, what for him had come to be substantial and meaningful and enduring. Now, you understand this is quite a question to bring together in a few minutes the sum and substance of one's life. But I believe, when I look back, that perhaps what I later called ultimate concern, concern about the meaning of one's life, was always my main concern. But this main concern did not lead to a particular and definitive commitment, because I was open to many elements in experience and many sides of our life. For instance, when I came to this country and had to introduce myself, so to speak, to the American scene, I wrote a kind of autobiography under the title On the Boundary Line. And uh, in this title, I described the boundary lines on which I used to live, not on the one side exclusively, not on the other side exclusively, but on the boundary line between them. For instance, one of the main boundary lines important for my work was that between philosophy and theology. And many of my writings deal directly or indirectly with this problem. Then another one between church and culture, the boundary line between the life within the church and the abundance of cultural creativities in our period of history which are not directly influenced by the church and are very often directly opposed to the church. And what is the relationship of them? All this uh, interested me in relationship to the basic problem which I call the problem of what's the meaning of my life and therefore what should be my ultimate concern. And so I could continue and draw quite a lot of boundary lines of this kind. Dr. Tillich, as you speak of boundary lines, the church on the one hand and the culture on the other, I'm not certain. Is there an element of conflict between them that's being expressed here? Yes, no, there's not only an element of conflict, but I would say in our period of history, at least since the Renaissance, there's a continuous conflict going on. Think of all the conflicts between theology and scientific movement. First, 
Galileo's conflict about the astronomic structure of our world, then later on the Darwinistic conflict about the way in which man came into being, then the conflict of, uh, about the nature of man in earlier times and in present time especially by the Freudian school, then the conflict between the conservative character of many churches and the criticism of society by the revolutionary movements in the 18th century, first done by bourgeoisie, then in the 20th century done by the labor movements. All this was, uh, at least in Europe, more than in America, I believe, in conflict with the traditional forms in which the church lived. And yet people in the church and people in art and people in science are trying to make statements about their universe, are they not? Why should there be this disparity? Yes, uh, now I am very glad that you say they make statements about the meaning of their lives. They do it in all these realms, of course. And no human being is actually what one calls with a very poor word, atheistic. Every human being has an ultimate concern. Not everybody calls it God, not even the Buddhists call it God, but everybody knows it is a religion. And so I would say that uh, they do it, they have their expressions of what the meaning of their life is, and they are committed to it. They are even often willing to sacrifice most of their life or their whole life to it, if necessary. And for this reason, I would call them religions or, with a more technical word, quasi-religions. The churches should have understood this, but they didn't. They mostly continued in their traditional forms of life and didn't ask the question, is our message, the way we are giving it now, still relevant for these people? Or is, has our message become irrelevant because they cannot understand anymore what originally was meant with the symbols in which Christianity expresses itself? And my whole theological work is an attempt to make the uh, foundations of Christianity again understandable and meaningful for the people of our time.